Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome to Europol for the launch of the European Cybercrime Centre, EC3. An important event in the evolution of the response in Europe to this most challenging form of international crime. I'm joined on the stage today by Cecilia Malmström, Commissioner for Home Affairs uh, in the European Commission, Charles Orting, the head of this new centre at Europol, John Omani, the chairman of the Europol Management Board, John Morton, the director of US Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency, and Josias van Aertsen, the mayor of The Hague. Now, each of them will say a few words shortly, but let me start by putting today's event in perspective. Contrary to popular opinion, cybercrime is not particularly new. Some observers have been warning about it for years. Indeed, this is what a former FBI officer said 25 years ago. As law enforcement focuses its attention on the traditional crimes which it is equipped to deal with and understand, computer-related crime will emerge as a threat to our economy and national security. What will be portrayed as a sudden and dramatic incidence of computer crime has grown steadily already for a decade, and law enforcement's technological knowledge and skills need to be honed to deal with future crimes. But even so, in the long run, law enforcement will have fallen behind by the year 2000. I think that was a pretty accurate prediction in both respects. Indeed, computer-related crime has emerged now as a threat to our economy and national security, as well as, of course, to the safety of many of our citizens who face multiple attacks every day to steal their identity and money. And also, with the exception of some specialist units uh, at local and national law enforcement agencies in Europe, our competence to deal with the modern dynamics of cybercrime is generally low and under-equipped. The problem is that cybercrime evolves so quickly, of course, outstripping the technological and budgetary capacities of most police teams. The last few years have witnessed not only the rise of hacktivist and anti-sec movements, but also variations of recognized attack vectors, including now police ransomware, mobile phone malware, and exploitation of social media. So for some years now, we've looked to the size of botnets and the number of malware samples as indicators of the scale of cyber criminal activity. But Europol's analysis suggests that we are now moving into an era of constantly shifting cloud-based botnets, for example, and a further massive expansion in cyber attacks on mobile devices. We're also concerned about the risks involved in consumers becoming more dependent on augmented reality and digital payment technologies. All of these trends offer big new opportunities to cyber criminals. Add to this a further anticipated increase in targeted cyber attacks, including those which result in physical disruption, and it's clear, therefore, that the task of protecting consumers, citizens, organizations from online threats is becoming more complex and demanding. Faced with global losses of billions of euros, terabytes of data per investigation, and in some cases, highly sophisticated criminal business models, law enforcement can no longer rely on traditional policing methods to successfully combat cybercrime or indeed online child sexual exploitation and online fraud. And that brings me back to the purpose of today. The establishment of EC3 represents a milestone in our common efforts to resist these new trends to fight back against the serious criminals involved and to deny them the cyberspace and opportunity that they're currently exploiting to harm governments, businesses, and citizens. Trollsorting will outline shortly in greater detail how our new center will operate. 
And in the course of the day, you will all have the opportunity to speak to a number of our specialists about their work. But I'd just like to highlight a few areas in which I personally believe the establishment of EC3 marks a real turning point. International coordination is the first. The notion of cybercrime as borderless is already something of a cliche. Yet so much is still lacking, I think, in our collective efforts to operate quickly and effectively on the international stage. In many respects, policing remains firmly rooted in local affairs for very good reasons in most, most of the time. But that culture and practice of localism is simply not good enough, not well equipped enough to deal with cyber issues. International coordination is one of Europol's core functions, and EC3 will therefore become a force multiplier for the fight against cybercrime throughout Europe and indeed beyond as we look to work with our partners on the international stage, including Interpol through its global complex for innovation in Singapore and many US partners and others as well. We can also have a tangible impact on levels of cybercrime through effective crime prevention by building and participating in trust networks such as the International Cybersecurity Protection Alliance, the Virtual Global Task Force, and the European Financial Coalition. We can reduce opportunities for crime in online environments, improve resilience, and raise awareness amongst potential targets and also share our knowledge and expertise in order to be better prepared for what lies ahead. But most of all, in the end, the success of EC3 will be measured in terms of its contribution to operational impact against cyber criminal activity. Here, EC3 will build on Europol's profile as the center of the EU law enforcement community. It will draw on our powerful databases which track organized crime and terrorist activity across Europe. And it will further develop our leading edge intelligence analysis functions and digital forensic skills. I think that's a pretty impressive package and it's one that will provide EC3 with the best environment in which to grow and flourish. And as the director of Europol, I'm delighted to establish EC3 as an important new part of our agency. I'd like to thank the Commissioner and the Council of Ministers for their confidence in this decision and the confidence in our agency's capabilities. Now, the conception of the idea for EC3 was certainly a very good one by Commissioner Malmström. The birth of that, chi of that child, meanwhile, has been a bit more difficult. The current climate of economic austerity in Europe uh, has meant that there is little new budgetary resource available to support its establishment. While most of you in this room have your own experience of budget difficulties in this current climate, and Europol should be no different, so we must get on with this task and be successful regardless. As Europol, therefore, we have reprioritized activity and resources to find the capability necessary to make sure that EC3 is a success at least until new resources become available in the EU. We've also relied on sister agencies such as ENISA, Eurojust, CEPOL, and the CERT EU community who have generously agreed to be actively involved in the delivery of EC3's core services. But in fact, everyone in this room has a key role to play in the success of EC3. You've been personally invited to this event because you and the organizations that you represent will be EC3's key stakeholders. The new center exists to add value to your work, and you in turn will be essential to its success. So we might have to start with modest ambitions and resources, but together I'm confident that we can quickly establish EC3 as a cornerstone in the fight against cybercrime in Europe. Now let me turn first to Commissioner Malmström, uh, also to ha add her few words on the establishment of EC3. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, 
it's a great honor for me to be in Den Haag today at the opening of the European Cybercrime Center, the EC3. It's in, indeed a day I've been looking forward to a lot. Ever since we in the European Union adopted the internal security more than two years ago, this was one of the priority, and I was convinced that we urgently had to set up this center. And we have received strong support from ministers, the European Parliament, stakeholders, and from the public on this. And here we are today. Many people have made great efforts to make this happen, but I would like to thank two of them particularly. The European Director, Mr. Wainwright, and Mr. Trolls Erting, the Director of the Centre. They have done immense work to make sure that this day is the day today. Some people might ask, why do we need a cybercrime centre in Europe? The short answer is to protect an open and free internet. As the uh, director said, new technologies have, been su have become such an important part of everyday life of our citizens, companies, organization, and authorities. We use Facebook, Skype, Twitter, Instagram to communicate with friends and family. Our banks have moved all their offices online. Furthermore, we manage our highways, our power supplies electronically, and authorities communicate very important information to the citizens on the internet. This is good news. But with our growing dependence on these technology also comes vulnerability and growing opportunities for criminals. And from what we've seen so far, the criminals are ahead of us when it comes to imagination and cooperation. Two years ago, while setting out the plans for this center, uh, I said that this is probably the golden age of cyber criminals. Unfortunately, we are still in that golden age for them. And people around Europe are worried about this. A recent Eurobarometer survey show that most EU internet users express high levels of concern about cybersecurity. 89% avoid disclosing personal information online due to security concerns. 74% agree that the risk of becoming a victim of cybercrime has increased. And since the use of cyberspace is bound to continue growing in our daily life, these trends are not to be taken lightly. And our challenge is to make cyberspace secure for citizens and companies so that we can all fully enjoy our digital lives. And our response is EC3. When deciding to put the Cybercrime Center, the analysis was to set it up here in Europol because it would be the most efficient and most cost-effective opinion option. And we do not start from scratch. With limited resources, Europol has done tremendous work in the field of cybercrime for a bit more than a decade now. Only last year, to cite one example, Operation Icarus, coordinated by Europol, identified 273 online child sexual abuse suspects. 113 of those suspects in 23 different countries were arrested. Many children were saved. The idea between IC3 is to have a forward-thinking center of highly skilled personnel, the best brains of Europe. The center will mark a significant step forward in the, EC's, in the European Union's endeavor to fight cybercrime and increase cybersecurity, building on human rights and fundamental freedom. In order to launch EC3 as quickly as possible, the services of the Commission has been working hand in hand with Europol to make this setup as smooth as possible. And it is no secret that one of the concerns have been financing. Everybody agrees that we need this center. Some even ask, why didn't you create it, created it years ago? Uh, but asking for more resources in this deep economic crisis in Europe is not an easy thing. Mr. Wainwright and Europol has been very generous in the past month and made more staff available to the centre. Uh, could, of course, not be, be, be excluded that more relocation need to be done in the future. Setting up EC3 doesn't come for free, and I mean it. And it will certainly, from my part, will fight for more resources uh, for the centre in every way I can. And despite tough economic times, I am optimistic that we will succeed. We cannot, of course, expect miracles. All the EU agencies are in general expected to cut stuff, not to get more people. So we need to have a long-term perspective. I would also like to thank member states who have seconded staff to the EC3 and encourage more countries uh, to do the same. Beside financing, a major issue in the preparation has been up to set up the EC3 programming board, whose constituent members are also here uh, with us today. The diversity of the board reflects the comprehensive approach needed to fight cybercrime. Ladies and gentlemen, as of today, 
EC3, we strive to be the European focal point in the fight against cybercrime, equipped with the state-of-the-art technology and a strong team of highly qualified personnel. The Centre will fulfil its mission in helping Member States to dismantle and to disrupt mo more cybercrime networks. It will develop detection and forensic tools for cybercrime investigations. It will provide specialised threat assessment, as well as offer more focused training for law enforcement, judges and prosecutors. So we need to be ambitious, but of course realistic. The centre cannot initially focus on all sorts of cybercrime. Fraud, intrusion and internet-related abuse of children are therefore amongst the crimes that will be targeted in the initial phase. Together with the United States, we recently launched the Global Alliance Against Child Sexual Abuse Online. 48 countries around the world have so far signed up to increase their efforts to fight this hideous crime. And I count on EC3 to be an important facilitator of the EU in this work. The key to success of the EC3 is cooperation, and not only within the law enforcement community. The EC3 will therefore work closely with a broad spectrum of partners from other e-agencies as well as computer emergency response teams, private sector, research community. Eventually the results will speak for themselves. And I'm convinced that the EC3 will manage to meet the expectation of member states because it is conceived to complement and boost the efforts to fight cybercrime that by its very nature knows no borders or jurisdictions. So let me conclude that this is a good day for Europe. By inaugurating the EC3, we send a signal to the cyber criminals that we will come after them. And by we, I mean all of you, the 27 member states, together with the institutions, industry, academia, civil society, and other partners that we cooperate with. Never before has the EU responded in such a strong way. It's bound to be a very promising year, and I wish the management and the staff of the EC3 and Europol all the best in delivering the results we need to make cyberspace more secure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Now, Europol is, I think, the best home for EC3, not least because of the modern facilities offered by this fine new building and the first-rate support we've always received from the Dutch government, our hosts, and indeed the municipality of The Hague. So I take this opportunity to thank the Mayor of The Hague, Mr. Van Aertsen, for the support that we have received and invite him now to the podium uh, to add a few words, please. Mr. Wainwright, thank you for your uh, introduction. Madam Commissioner, uh, ladies uh, and gentlemen, one computer break-in per day, that was uh, the headline in a well-known Dutch uh, newspaper in 1984, that is. It's one of the oldest newspaper articles I could find in the Netherlands in which the word computer crime occurs. It describes not only the theft of disks and tapes, how dated that sounds now, but also external break-ins using telephone and home computer. It's hard to believe that these, uh, well, let's say very beginnings and early beginnings of cybercrime were less than 30 years ago. Now, many of us can no longer imagine life without uh, the PC, the tablet, or the smartphone. All over the world, we are uh, sometimes continuously interconnected. Unfortunately, and uh, the previous speakers already referred to it, of course, the same is true of criminals. Uh, they are very keen to move with the times. In fact, being up to date is necessary for them to be able to ply their trade. Whereas in the past, they would look for the best cutting torches for cracking safes and the fastest cars for evading capture by the police. Now, in 2013, uh, criminals are making every attempt to stay one step ahead in cyberspace. And given that cybercrime is a cross-border phenomenon par excellence, the establishment of this European cybercrime center here at Europol 
is a major step forward. And we, the city of The Hague, we are pleased to extend a very warm welcome to this center here in The Hague. And The Hague, of course, is a fitting location. Of course, we are the international city of peace and justice, second UN city and a European city as well. But in addition to that, security industry, so to say, has become more increasingly important and a pillar of the economy of the city of The Hague. This security cluster here in the city or in the The Hague region, the The Hague security delta, as we have coined it, is set to become the largest in Europe in the next few years. Anyway, we're striving towards it. There's already been an enormous concentration of businesses, institutes, government bodies and international organizations here in The Hague and in the security domain for some time. In recent years, we've been working with the sector at creating the right facilities and conditions for turning that concentration into a powerful cluster. Helping to build a safer world is an economic growing market as well. Cybercrime forms a fundamental threat to our businesses, to our governments, and especially to us all, to our society. Therefore, there's a huge amount of catching up to do when it comes to the security of our system. And um, this demand for more cybersecurity is providing opportunities for economic growth. It's maybe a little bit paradoxical, but it is a fact. We are therefore greatly pleased to be home to all these government bodies, international institutions, and of course, the business sector related to cybersecurity based in our city. And we can say without reservation that the European Cybercrime Center EC3 is the ultimate international symbol of this cyber cluster. We are very glad that Europol has become a partner to the Hague Security Delta in many areas. The cluster has, be, has to be in a position to pave the way to bringing about public-private cooperation in the security field, and if it's needed anywhere, then it's needed in cyber security. We can only win the race, the race, the cyber race with cyber criminals if we work together. And there is anyway one problem, there are many problems to be tackled, but one problem, specific, specific problem to be tackled. And that is just the fast growing demand for cyber security so solutions, systems and products is leading to a considerable shortage on the labor market. There are simply not enough qualified people at present who really understand, who re really understand what cybercrime involves and how it can be counterbalanced with cyber security. And in order to secure that more cyber security professionals come to the labor market, the city of The Hague is developing a cyber security academy under the leadership of the former Minister of Defense, Albert von Middelkoop, who is here present as well. Together we do it, together with many institutions in, uh, in The Hague, and uh, of course with this important institution, Europol, here in our city. Well, in many aspects, we are trying to become, forgive me to say that here uh, this morning, Madam, Madam Commission, we are trying to become the center of excellence in the security field in the European Union. Madam Commissioner, with the arrival of EC3, European Cybercrime Center, as part of Europol, The Hague is now again home to another important security organization. It's good for The Hague and it's good for Europe. In my view, investing in new developments is crucial in our times for us and, of course, for Europe as a whole. The ideas of Keynes, in my view, are not dead. Our economy, so investing is important, not only economy and budget cuts 
although we need them at some times, but investing is important as well. Our economy and democratic society based on the rule of law depend on good cyber security, and you can always count on the city of The Hague. Thank you very much. Wise words, Mr. Mayor, thank you very much. Next, I invite John O'Mahony to speak uh, on behalf of the current uh, Irish presidency of the EU, but also in his specific capacity as the current chairman of the Europol Management Board, uh, which represents, of course, the core constituency of Europol's member states and our key operational partners in the EU. John, please. Commissioner, uh, Ms. Malstrom, Director Wainwright, Mr. Van Artsen, Mayor of The Hague, Mr. Arting, Head of the European Cybercrime Centre, and Mr. Martin, Director of US ICE. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Europol Management Board, I am delighted to have been given this opportunity to address you this morning on this important and historic occasion of the launch of the Europe, uh, European Cybercrime Centre. I am confident that the centre will become a key part of Europe's response to various threats that already exist and have existed indeed for some time and new and emerging threats. These will emerge from the online world. I am also confident that the centre will provide a foundation for the future, a focal point where we can centralise our intelligence skills and resources to prevent and detect crimes committed by cyber criminals. In financial terms alone, cybercrime has the potential to pose a larger threat to society than the illicit drugs market trade does at present. Indeed, Rob, you mentioned earlier on the FBI officer 25 years ago, and indeed he had his finger on the pulse, and only recently FBI Director Mr. Robert Mueller, speaking in, in the United States, warned businesses and governments there that cybercrime will soon pose the greatest threat to the United States of America. Organized criminals and terrorists will continue to utilize and to exploit the online arena to advance their criminal capabilities and profitability. This threat is increasing, and we have all seen real harm caused to law-abiding citizens of Europe, to their businesses, and to their government services. Our citizens have the right to conduct their communications, transactions, and businesses in a safe and secure online environment. All European citizens need to be protected from the threats being posed. The European Cybercrime Centre will provide vital support to member states and to the institutions of the European Union by building world-class operational and analytical expertise. The rapid development and changes that we have witnessed in technology, particularly over the last decade, present new and ongoing challenges for policing and for law enforcement. The transborder nature of cybercrime is an obvious example of this. We must adapt accordingly, and in order to ensure this, a coordinated response at national, EU, and international level is required. When investigating cybercrime, the capacity for national police forces to cooperate and engage with each other is vitally important. Cybercrime, by its nature, is evolving on a day-to-day -day basis, and the creation of the European Cybercrime Centre ensures that European law enforcement agencies will be best equipped to develop the skills and techniques to stay, if not a step ahead, at least with those cybercriminals. Technology can be a double-edged sword, and the same technological advances that are exploited by criminals also present opportunities to law enforcement officers and to enhance our ability in the prevention and detection of crime. I see the European Cybercrime Centre as a direct example of the ability of policing to adapt to this changing environment. Ms. Malmström, the European Commission has, in my view, correctly selected Europol to host the Cybercrime Centre. 
Europol is already Europe's specialist law enforcement centre for operational support, coordination and expertise, and has over the years won the respect of member states in this regard. It is important, therefore, that the European Cybercrime Centre is fully resourced and has all the necessary tools to be at the cutting edge of policing so as to counteract internet organised crime into the future. I fully acknowledge the difficult financial times that we operate in, but I equally recognise the importance of the work of Europol and wish to emphasise that in the long term, building and developing the European Cybercrime Centre should occur in harmony with the important and valuable mission that Europol is already engaged in. And I welcome uh, Commissioner Malmström's um, remarks in, in this regard this morning. From my ongoing role as the Irish Delegate on the Europol Management Board, and now in my role as Management Board Chairperson, I want to assure the Director of Europol, Mr Wainwright, and also our ultimate stakeholders, the citizens of Europe, that you will have the support and commitment of the Management Board in the continued development of the Europol Cybercrime Centre and of Europol into the future. In closing, I would like to remind you of the words of James Joyce from Ulysses, I am tomorrow or some future day what I established today. I am today what I established yesterday or some previous day. In establishing the European Cybercrime Centre here today, we are building a safer future for all our European citizens. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Well, I mentioned earlier the value of international cooperation. The problems of cybercrime, of course, in Europe are not specific only to our continent. And we look forward to working with all our international partners to make sure that EC3 is a success also in global terms. Of course, these partners include many important ones in the United States. So I'm particularly delighted that one of our principal partner agencies, US Immigration and Customs Enforcement, is represented here today by its director, John Morton. Thank you, John, for coming so far to join us today. John and I have agreed that today we will sign a common letter of intent which sets the framework for cooperation between Europol and ICE in this area of cybercrime. And we will shortly sign that joint undertaking here on the stage, so in front of 300 witnesses. But before doing so, let me ask John to say a few words at the podium, please. Thank you. Well, thank you, Rob. Uh, greetings to you all. Good morning. Uh, thank you all for coming today. It's good to see so many uh, faces here. I'm here for two reasons. Uh, one, to demonstrate that the relationship between the United States and Europe is as strong as it's ever been, and I'm absolutely delighted to be here. Uh, I'm also here to tell you that this will work, because um, ICE uh, runs the U.S. version of this called C3, the Cyber, uh, Cyber Crime Center, and we've been doing that since uh, 1997, and it, uh, it will work have to stay focused. We've had our ups and downs, but it has ended up being a resounding success. And I look forward uh, as the head of C3 in the United States to providing the uh, support and cheering uh, as this becomes a, a runaway success here uh, in Europe. I also want to just emphasize that you know, we, we talk a lot uh, in abstracts, but this is really at the end of the day about public safety. It's about making uh, our citizens uh, feel secure, and it is about addressing very, very real harms uh, that hurt uh, ordinary people, that hurt the people that we serve. It's why at the end of the day, in my view, uh, law enforcement is a great calling. Uh, we're uh, here to protect uh, the public from the harms of criminals, and in many instances, protecting people who can't protect themselves. And I'll give you two quick examples that I think uh, resonate as very deeply why we need uh, an EC3, why we need international cooperation, why online crime is a challenge to us all that has to be addressed head on and relentlessly. Um, in November of 2010, and this is a 
particular example that our Dutch friends in the audience will uh, remember. In November of 2010, uh, ICE was searching a man's house in Boston, Massachusetts, which is on uh, the northeast coast of the United States. And we came across a series of images uh, in that search on the person's uh, computer uh, that involved a two-year-old boy holding a small stuffed animal. And it was a Caucasian boy, but the scenes in the images, when analyzed by our computer forensic experts, we determined that the image didn't reflect child abuse going on in the United States, but probably in Europe. And there was no question from the series of images that very serious child abuse was going on involving this two-year-old boy. And so working uh, with our friends, our images were circulated uh, in Europe. And ultimately, a Dutch police officer recognized that the stuffed toy was a rabbit that was unique uh, to this country. And uh, the images were shown on Dutch TV. The uh, family members of the young boy uh, recognized him, uh, called the police. Uh, the perpetrator also happened to be watching the very same television show and went home and started to try to destroy materials on his computer. And at the end of the day, Mr. Mickelson uh, was arrested, and he had been sadly working at a daycare center uh, in Amsterdam. And as the Dutch in the audience know, 87 children uh, were abused by Mr. Mickelson. In turn, we searched his computer. That led us back to the United States and all over the world, and we've ultimately arrested 45 people and, and saved about 150 children from that particular operation that started uh, in Boston, Massachusetts, and literally through sophisticated forensic analysis of computers led around the world. And it's still ongoing to this day. Last week in the United States, I uh, announced the results of Operation Sunflower, in which we spent six weeks focusing through our cybercrime center on uh, online sexual exploitation of children, and in the space of six weeks, we arrested 245 sexual offenders that we had identified through the internet, and we rescued um, 123 children. And the reason I mention that particular case is, one, it was done on the back of our cyber crime center, but more importantly, the lead in that case came from Europe. The lead that started the Sunflower case came uh, from uh, Danish police, and they were looking at a series of images online uh, and a chat room, chat board, where a uh, young man was talking about his intent to rape a young teenage girl that was his relative. And the Danish uh, police sent us the chat, sent us the images, and Again, using our forensic analysis, we determined that one of the images, which was a photograph being taken from a car, and it showed a highway sign, but it was blurred, was a highway sign that had a sunflower image on it. And we further determined that that sunflower image is unique to one of our 50 states, the state of Kansas. And so taking those images that we had developed through the analysis uh, at the Cybercrime Center and elsewhere. We then sent agents up and down the highways in the state of Kansas. Uh, I doubt many of you have been to the state of Kansas, but there are many highways in the state of Kansas, and they're very lonely highways. There aren't many buildings, there aren't many people, there are a lot of cows and livestock, but uh, not a lot to see. And we went up and down that highway until we found the exact sign that was in that picture. We then went to the local law enforcement, and there were some other images that the Danish police had sent us, one of which involved a pool. The local law enforcement were able to identify the pool. We went to the town in which that pool was located, talked to the sheriff, and then he was able to determine uh, from another image that had been sent us who the intended victim was. And we did this all in the space of 13 days, and we were able to intervene 
and prevent that girl from being raped. She ultimately was not raped because we were able to arrest the young man who was uh, online and soliciting advice as to how to rape her, and he's in jail. Uh, and that's good law enforcement, and it wouldn't have happened without the sophisticated analysis that we were capable of doing at the Cybercrime Center. So it's why I end uh, my brief remarks here by just saying stick to it. This will work. It will work well. You'll put a lot of criminals in jail where they belong, and you'll uh, protect the public safety, which is, I uh, assume, why all of you are here today. I know it's why we're all uh, up here. It's good work. It's important work. You need to do it uh, for your citizens. You need to do it uh, for the Europe, and you also need to do it uh, you know, for all of us collectively, because that's the big challenge of the Internet, is that this really isn't a European problem anymore. It's not a U.S. problem. It is a shared global problem. Uh, that, that we take a lead from uh, the Danish police and, and solve a crime in Kansas uh, tells you uh, what we're dealing with. So with that, thank you very much. I appreciate being invited. It's a great honor to be here. Uh, Rob, I think this will be a runaway success. And uh, you have your friends in the United States who are ready to support the cause. Um, I, I can't um, give you any uh, large amounts of funds. You'll have to look to the commissioner for that. Um, but. <laughs> I'm with you in spirit, uh, and I, I'm, I support the cause in full. So thank you very much uh, for inviting us. It's been a great honor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, John, also for those very powerful examples of, of why uh, all of us are engaged in, in this work and why s international cooperation as part of that work is, is so necessary. Well, we end this, this formal session, or, or the final keynote speaker at least, will be uh, Troll Zorting, uh, the head of our cybercrime center, Trolls, is, uh, has been a senior officer of Europol for a number of years and uh, has led the early establishment of this center commendably well, also alongside um, his staff, of course. And he and three of his senior experts will now talk to you in a bit more detail about the work of the center, Trolls. Thank you very much, Director, and uh, thank you also, Ms. Malmstrom, for giving Europol this great task. Am I nervous? Maybe a bit. Cybercrime, 500 million people in the EU, 2.9 million law enforcement officers, and loads of crime. Uh, a, a relatively modest start and a huge development in the crime. Am I confident? Yes, I am. And I'll tell you why I am. There are two things, in my point of view, that makes a difference in normal organized crime. We have always had transnational organized crime, international crime. What is the new phenomenon here? What is the, the change? The change is that in this crime, you don't have to be present as the perpetrator. If you kill somebody, if you rape somebody, if you rob somebody, if you smuggle drugs, whatever, you have a physical location. This is the only crime where you actually don't need to be present. Secondly, you can hide very, very efficient and very effectively on the internet. And there are tools for this which makes it very, very difficult. But can we mitigate this? Of course we can. And that's also why the concept is right here, to create a platform for the 27 member states and good friends from the United States, Australia, Norway, Switzerland, other countries who are working with us to exchange information, because this is the name of the game. No police officer in any country here will investigate all the burglaries that we see every day. We profile, we find the 10 worst, we take them out of circulation. This is the same we should do on cybercrime. We have to profile, find the worst, eliminate those. 
There will be bicycle thefts also on the internet. We have to avoid it. Deep in the roots of the police tradition is unfortunately not the gift to share. They share this with journalists. If you have a good source, a good story, you keep it for yourself. But is there a difference here? Yes. In two weeks from now, I can celebrate 33 years in the police. And for the first time in my work, I've seen that actually my colleagues, they not only want to share, but they also dare to share. Valuable information, because they know that if they do not share, they will not be able to identify and they will not be able to do something about the crime. And what does the Cybercrime Center also signals? A complete shift in what we are doing. Normally, what we are doing is trying, what Inisa is helping with, is hardening the infrastructure. More locks on the doors, more lead at the windows, more change procedures. But we don't want to live in a society, in our homes, where we have to have more locks on the doors and uniformed guards. We don't want to live in that way, and we don't want to live in that way on the internet either. So we have to look at the perpetrator, and this is what this sensor is about, also to make a shift and make it unattractive to be a criminal. <coughs> so I'm confident because I have the support from the 27 member states and their experts and their chiefs in the cybercrime units. But I'm also confident because I have a very good staff. It might not be the biggest staff in the world, but it's a very dedicated staff. Not just work harder, they also work smarter. And in this organization, we also have a lot of technology that can help us, so we only have to interact with a human being when we have a path, when we have a pattern. What is it that we will try to deliver? First of all, an overview on the crime. I guess that France, Hungary, Italy has an overview on the crime in their country, but nobody has a helicopter perspective. We will make sure that everybody has it. Based on this, we will simply address the, crim the crimes. And what is it that we will focus on? We'll focus on people out there, the criminal groups who steal your money, your profile, your information, and child sexual molesters. This is what we will start by doing, and we will do this well. We, I'm also confident because we are not alone. When I look here, I see Steve Purser from Enisa, who is a member of, of the board. Enisa is a very valuable supporter, and they take care of the, the search, and they take care of all the infrastructure, but they inject all this information to us. Eurojust, no investigation without prosecution, so we of course need the prosecutors. They are also a vital partner, and actually Eurojust has just decided to inject a liaison officer here in the center. Capacity building training. This is the remit of CEPO. Mr. Banfi is here, and they are also a strong supporter in the board, and they will also take over some of the work that we need to, to deal with, because we cannot do this alone, of course. But we can use all the capacities that we already have built, not just in the member states, but also in the organizations. And Freddy, my good friend from CERT EU, will also help us with a lot of his knowledge and information about the real attacks and we will profile based on this. But unfortunately, the ownership of the critical infrastructure is not of the hands of the public. It's the hands of the private companies. So we need to outreach also. So we will reach out to ICSPA, to private companies, to entities, in order to create a good relationship and also a dare to share between them. Not about personal sensitive data, but about new trends and about strategies so that we can dress our future police officers with the right equipment and with the right education. The European Cybercrime Center, and you can hear it, the European Cybercrime Center is a European entity, but this is a global crime. I profoundly believe that there is so much crime in the world that there is enough for everybody. So we don't need to fight to take care of crime. But that is also why I look to my good friend, the Buru from Interpol, who will lead the Interpol Center in Singapore and I've invited him to be part of the board, and he has kindly invited me to be part of his board, so we will, for the first time, build up complementary together with these two organizations. And this is what is required of us, and this is what we should do. So this will be not a center, this will be a very inclusive approach. We will actually make this a team, and only if we work together as a team, we will win. And I actually intend to win, not the battle for a risk and crime-free world. I've been too many years in the police, so I believe this still. But in a world where we'll have an acceptable level of the crime. 
Now I can also tell you that we have not just been sitting on our hands here in the sensor, we have actually been working. And the sensor is new by name, but it's building on existing capacities in the high tech crime sensor. So we've already been working. And now I will hand over to some of the experts to tell you with tangible examples what we are doing and what is the added value. And then I will conclude after that. But first of all, I would like to invite Mr. Jacques van Oost to the podium. He is a, a Dutch police officer with a long experience in this field. And he will tell us about intrusion, bank trojans, mm -hmm. and all the atrocities that we see from this field. Yeah, the floor is yours. Thank you, Charles, uh, for giving me this opportunity. And uh, I'm indeed Jaap van Os, uh, standing here physically before you. On the internet, identities might change, but you have to deal with me right here, right now. And um, I am a team lead in, uh, let's say, complicated uh, cybercrime operations. The main thing we try to do, I must say, is just we are after cyber criminal organizations because let's face it, uh, that is what we current, uh, currently experience in, uh, in Europe. Cyber criminal groups preying upon the internet and the internet users uh, to make money. And uh, they use hacking, malicious software in botnets in order to attack the services we have uh, on the internet. These groups will on attack our online banking systems and probably empty our bank accounts. They will compromise our email boxes and sift through them for interesting information. They will hijack our data and extort us for money. They are after this personal and financial information, which is such a valuable asset on the internet. And they will trade it on the so-called underground economy. They use hacking as a tool to enter our computer systems and network, create that malware to leave behind on the compromised machines, and use the malware and the compromised machines to build botnets. Hacking malware and botnets are basically the toolkit of the contemporary cyber criminal. And armed with that, they run a cyber criminal business and steal and harvest that information. And I want to mention two specific examples that we are faced with now. And uh, that is the police ransomware and online banking fraud. And we expect those areas to grow in the coming time. So as we all know, probably police ransomware is a malware that is used by cyber criminals to lock data on our machines and then ask for ransom to unlock it. It uses police logos to reinforce that scam and to convince the users to pay. Once infected, you will get a pop-up screen uh, telling you that your PC has been blocked uh, because you've downloaded some illegal material or you, or you surf some dodgy sites and that you have to pay a fine of an average of 100 euros. And, um, there is a malware very, police malware variant uh, in almost every country in Europe, abusing local corporate police identities. But the specific one you see here uh, is uh, using the Europol logo. And of course, it's aimed at the whole of Europe, which gives the criminals a much broader set of potential victims. Clever. And uh, of course, just a bit about that. A fine of 100 euros doesn't seem that much, but the potential is in the numbers. A successful a ca a campaign of about 70,000 infected machines will, um, and taking into account that about 3% of the victims will actually pay, will still deliver the cyber criminal with more than 200,000 euros. But what is more, such a campaign already has 70,000 victims with their computer locked. And to get 70,000 infected machines, the criminals have to compromise 10 to 20 times that amount. And that's the real scale of the problem. And another large scale problem is that of the banking Trojan. What you see here is uh, the deployment uh, of the Zeus Banker Trojan, it's just an example. Don't pay too much attention, it's a, 
a visual support for my message. Um, a banking trojan, as we know, is a piece of malicious software. And once you get it on your machine, it aims at stealing your banking credentials. It will then interfere with your online banking sessions, that way adding transactions, changing transactions, or basically empty your bank account. And there are specific cyber criminal groups dedicated to developing, maintaining, and exploiting banking malware with exotic names such as SpyEye, Zeus, Citadel, Ice9. But moreover, this banking Trojan industry has evolved into a lively cyber criminal business that uses the underground economy as its virtual marketplace. Currently, these groups attack almost every bank in Europe. It's estimated that about, a different, uh, about 80 different malware families are on the market right now. That is not to say that they are all successful. It's an indication of the scale of the problem. And we shouldn't, um, and this type of cybercrime actually is also inspected to increase. Not exponentially like the police ransomware, but nevertheless, we shouldn't let these criminals get away with it. And um, one note, I think also in this cyber criminal economy, carding plays an important uh, role. But that's what my colleague Marshall will talk about. What rests me to say is this. EC3 will not only identify the criminals and the cyber criminal groups. We will also take apart the cyber criminals infrastructure and disrupt their business in the, com in the years to come. And we will do this, of course, in joint action with and across all borders with all our partners. And, and on a personal note, um, I didn't start 25 years ago. Maybe it looks that way, but that's just the stress of this week. Um, I started about 15 years ago in this area. And I could only dream of being in the center of this international fight against cybercrime. And now I am. And I must say, that feels great. Thank you. Thank you, very much. Thank you so much, Jaap, for this uh, very concrete example. As you know, we, we all have our the net banking, and we all have the information. But what we are now getting used to now is to use our smartphones. So we will not use our credit cards anymore, we'll pay a lot on the smartphones. Another concern is that in the EU, we are internet penetrated, 72% has access to the internet. But a lot of the countries that we can expect crime from, South America, Africa, whatever, are very, very low penetrated by internet. This will change. And when this changes, this will also affect us much more because we will have the crime from the outside, in specifically one area, and that is mobile payment. So I have a very good Polish expert who leads our terminal team, and he will now give you a flavor of what we are doing in this area. Please, Martin. Thank you, Truls, very much for the introduction. I have only five minutes, so let me go directly to the point. Uh, I'm, going, I'm going to focus on two aspects. Uh, first of all, uh, the, problem, uh, the problem of electronic payments in the European Union, and also the European Cybercrime Center, and what we can do to improve efficiency of law enforcement agencies in the European Union. Uh, Europol has recently published a uh, situation report on payment card fraud. Uh, payment card fraud is uh, low risk uh, ver and very profitable criminal activity for organized crime groups, which brings them 1.5 billion euro of criminal assets. Uh, 1.5 billion euro, this is money which can be invested in further criminal activities. Um, ill illegal immigration, mm, financing of terrorism, or uh, development of further criminal uh, techniques to affect uh, online payments, in the European Union, <clears throat> this is the problem. Organized crime groups are well structured. They are active uh, globally uh, because of the internet, online payments, uh, electronic transactions overseas. This is the international problem. And that is the major challenges of the European law enforcement agencies. And there is an uh, important role for the European Cybercrime Center to coordinate 
activities of law enforcement agencies in order to improve efficiency. When we are talking about uh, criminal structures involved in uh, online payments, uh, electronic payments, such groups, again, are very well organized, are global. And as an example from one of our uh, recent cases, uh, the leader of such group is usually located in one country. Uh, he's sitting in, on, in front of the computer. He's never traveling abroad. He has a very strong uh, technical team to support his activities with tools, equipment, software. He has also very mobile uh, criminals to be deployed in different countries in order to steal our financial information via uh, special techniques, malicious software skimming and other activities. And there is also very um, strong kind of logistic team to support with accommodation, means of transport and also a team deployed in different countries, usually overseas, to perform illegal transactions and finally send uh, criminal assets back to the European Union. This is the structure of such criminal group, which of course uh, determine proper uh, approach of law enforcement agencies. And of course it wouldn't be possible for one national police force to combat efficiently such problem. The role of the European Cybercrime Center is to initiate specific investigative measures on the international level and properly uh, coordinate um, uh, investigative measures. Of course we are aware about high expectations toward the European Cybercrime Centers, but we are sure we will be able to fulfill the requirements like we did in the recent operations three weeks ago, a huge operation against more than 100 suspects, um, operation initiated by the Italian authorities, but uh, very soon it appeared that it's really international criminal group which affected uh, financial information from more than 20 member states of the European Union. Hundreds, thousands of victims were identified in Europe. Uh, criminals managed to, after obtaining uh, financial information, send them to overseas to some South American, Central American countries for illegal transactions. So that, of course, determined um, need for cooperation on a global level. And then finally, criminal assets were sent back to the European Union to criminals who uh, had never traveled abroad. During this operation, we had to analyze 240,000 um, mobile phone, uh, phones intercepted during this uh, operation. We had to organize cross-border observation. Uh, we had to uh, analyze thousands, hundreds of thousands of illegal transactions. Uh, exchange 71 European arrest warrants uh, and deploy for the final arrest 400 police officers across Europe to arrest uh, finally 105 uh, suspects. So again, this is excellent success of uh, national police forces in Europe. Excellent case, but it wouldn't be possible to have the, the, the final uh, outcome without proper coordination on an on a in international level. So that's again the, the, the role of the European Cybercrime Center. When we are talking about the coordination from our side, it's not only a matter of coordination of a final rate, but it's a coordination of activities from the very beginning, from the moment that we notice that the case is international collection of information, analysis, uh, initiation of investigative measures on the international level, operational meetings, and finally, um, suggestion for, for final arrest of suspects. But when we are talking about the role and expectations towards the European Cybercrime Center in this area, we have to be also aware that uh, we should be also a voice of uh, national law enforcement agencies uh, to present, to analyze future threats and present certain recommendations in order to implement countermeasures. Uh, as Trull said, today we are talking about credit card fraud, about online payments. Tomorrow we will be talking about um, mobile payments, mobile phones used for uh, illegal transactions. But we are sure that working with our partners from the industry, we can make a difference and we will continue the cooperation with our ultimate goal to be sure that such message will never appear on uh, POS terminals on during the internet payments. We, our ultimate goal is to make sure that uh, criminal structures will never affect 
online payments in the European Union, and the citizens of the European Union feel safe and secure during these transactions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marcin, for this uh, excellent presentation. Unfortunately, crime at the internet is not just traditional cyber crimes and bits and bytes and money. It's also real life, it's blood. It's one of its internet facilitated crime. And one of the worst parts of internet facilitated crime is actually the sexual abuse of children, which has grown exp exponentially on, on the internet and where they, uh, their ability to hide is, is very high. We've been very active in this field and my good friend, and uh, colleague Valerio Pavagiorgi, who is an Italian police officer, unfortunately leaves us very soon to another commitment, but he will give you a flavor of what we have been doing in, in, in the last 10 years and what we intend to do in the coming 10. Thank you very much, distinguished panel members, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm going to give you some information about the current trends we are facing in online child sexual exploitation, and which is the response provided by the European Cybercrime Center. As a responsible officer uh, in these last years for this crime area, I can proudly say that Europol has indeed been uh, already very successful. We have, we have supported and coordinated uh, uh, 30 high-impact operations. And when I say high-impact operations, I refer to those operations that uh, uh, involved 20 or more countries around the world. Uh, we have been able to support our law enforcement partners in the identification of more than 3,500 child sex offenders. But we are facing new challenges. We are facing these new challenges that uh, form actually the part called the Internet Underground. Uh, child sexual abuse material is going through these channels deep web and darknet. What are these deep web and darknet? Deep web is, is uh, just to give a, a short explanation, is the part of the internet that is not indexed. You will not find the child abuse material that is exchanged in the deep web using the conventional search engines. The darknet is something different. Using the uh, conventional online environments on the internet, you can download an application and uh, you encrypt the communication. So you will encrypt the exchange of child abuse material and it will not be possible for law enforcement to, to intercept and to understand what kind of content is exchanged uh, between child sex offenders using these applications. But which is the response of the European Cybercrime Center? We have several techniques. I have listed the main techniques that we use to access the data when we receive contributions from our law enforcement partners and how we analyze this data. Uh, here in this slide, you can see a chart which is an example of a concept, social network analysis uh, applied to criminal networks. Uh, the uh, spots uh, in red and in, grid, in green, which are bigger than the others, represent the nevralgic, nevralgic points of this network. Uh, these are the main suspects of these child sex offender networks. When we disseminate intelligence packages to our uh, uh, colleagues, these packages have to be as accurate and complete as possible. So we have to be able to tell them what the suspects are communicating to other um, um, suspects to other criminals, uh, all the information of the specific user, all the technical data that is aiming at identifying this specific user, and obviously the child abuse material, the videos, the pictures that this person has eventually exchanged. This is cross-matched with the database, an intelligence database that we have at Europol. It's called the Twins, Focal Point Twins. And uh, the results of these activities are put together in an intelligence analysis report produced by Europol and sent to the law enforcement agencies uh, uh, in the EU and in the partner countries. At this moment, we have already started our activities against the darknet and against the deep web. We have already concluded two, investigation, uh, two investigations against the darknet. We have already disseminated more than 480 packages. Every package should, be, should serve 
to identify uh, a suspect, a specific uh, child sex offender. In fact, 67 have already been uh, identified and the 23 of the 67 have been arrested. When uh, we write high profile child sex offenders, we mean child sex molesters or producers or distributors of child abuse material. Seven victims have already been identified. In relation to the deep web, we are currently supporting five major investigations. All these investigations involve at least 30 countries. We have already detected thousands, unfortunately, thousands child sex offenders. Uh, we are confronted with newly produced child abuse material. This material is depicting uh, very small children, in some cases, babies. Uh, before the director of ICE has uh, talked about uh, some interesting uh, cases in cooperation with, uh, with uh, some EU member states, uh, um, we have also had uh, uh, important cases uh, also with ICE and with other partner countries. Uh, and this is a new trend we are, we are, we are, uh, we are uh, confronted with. The age of the victims is, is getting smaller and smaller. But finally, these offenders uh, thought that they were undetectable, but in my personal opinion, they are not. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Valerio, for this uh, interesting and also a bit sad presentation about an environment that seems to be there and actually also expand a bit. This was the end of the presentation of the practical examples from the European Cybercrime Center. I hope that you have the feeling now that we have tried to hit the ground running. No, we've just been sitting and waiting and wrapping and unwrapping software. We have actually been working. What we are doing now is that we are increasing the work and with the help and support of our good friends inside the law enforcement and outside the member states, we will prevail. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Sean Peterson uh, in charge of media handling uh, European Corporate Communications. In a few moments, the floor will be open to questions from the media, to the distinguished members of the panel, and also to our three experts. But first, I have to give you some practical information. Uh, there is an expo with, manned with uh, staff from EC3 right out there in the central hall. And these people, they are ready um, to speak to all the guests. They're not prepared to speak to the journalist. Um, but we have some uh, special uh, people who have volunteered to be uh, available. They cover five, six, seven languages. They will be in the press room. It's also right out there, straight forward, and then in the press room to the right. Um, for our VIP guest, there is a guided tour. You just have to stay put here, and then there'll be some nice people coming and picking you up right after this session. And then last but not least, uh, lunch. It will be in the restaurant, and from 12.30 until 1.30. So now the floor is open for questions uh, from the journalist. Um, who will go first? Yes, over there, lady. One moment, you will have a microphone. Hello, it's Jennifer Baker from IDG News. I'm wondering what you do to protect your own network here and what sort of data is going to be stored in EC3? Okay, we have of course prepared ourselves for this day, this opening day, and um, we have, and now I have to knock on wood, um, we have done all what we can to secure our network. And, and nothing at the internet is 100% secure, we know this. But we have done our best, and we have a system now that is in place for also trying to monitor 24-7 what is happening of the activities. And we have in this new very nice building the best equipment to do so. I will not fully guarantee that no breach can take place because this would be very stupid of me, but I can assure you that we have done the best that we can, and we are well prepared. Yes, and I could, I could add that we are already facing some, some threats from the usual hacktivist movements. Um, but as Troll says, um, you know, one of the reasons for establishing EC3 at Europol is that we already have inbuilt very high-level uh, data protection, data security standards here. 
Uh, it doesn't guarantee that we won't uh, be attacked. Uh, no agency in the world can guarantee that. There are plenty of other intelligence and famous intelligence and police agencies that have already been attacked. Uh, but, the, but we have very strong levels of protection. We're confident in particular that the most sensitive data that, that we are handling um, is, is, is very secure indeed. Helmut. Good morning, everybody. My name is Helmut Hetzler, foreign correspondent for German, Austrian, and Swiss uh, media. I would like to ask a question about the financing of the European Cyber Crime Center. C can you say something how it is financed and how many how huge is your budget and do you maybe need more money? Well, I can tell you that um, the Europol budget is, is 84 million euros, uh, supporting um, approximately 800 staff here. That staff includes approximately 150 liaison officers that uh, are from um, our community of, of member states. So out of that budget of 84 million, uh, it's difficult to identify precisely how much goes to EC3 because we have fully integrated EC3 into the fabric and structure of Europol. Potentially, every resource at Europol is available to support EC3. Um, the, the amount that we start with is approximately 10%, maybe more than that, but I would caution about using that figure as, as the overall amount that is being um, invested in EC3. In reality, it's much more than that. What is being invested in EC3 is the whole of the Europol architecture, and indeed it's supporting member states and national units around the 27 uh, member states. So the, the global community of active support for EC3 is actually quite significant. As for the future, well, uh, these are difficult economic times. Um, I expect that EC3 will need to grow. Um, that depends on this first year and, and, and how we establish ourselves and how successful we are. And of course, further investment also depends on economic situation in the EU. But you heard this morning from the Commissioner already that she is committed personally uh, to providing as much assistance as possible in the future. And I have no doubt that we will find an optimum level uh, in the years to come. <laughs> uh, AP? Mike Corder from AP. I have a question for Mr. Morton. Uh, could you outline for us just how close the cooperation will be between the US and uh, you've obviously been at this for longer than Europol. Can, do you have any words of wisdom advice for EC3? Well, I think the cooperation will be quite extensive. There are already um, US representatives, in, including um, from ICE, assigned to Europol, uh, I think you'll see that grow in uh, the coming months and years, and a number of U.S. law enforcement agencies are contemplating uh, permanent assignments here to Europol, and uh, ICE is included in that. Uh, I also think that this level of international cooperation is not just uh, an, an ideal or um, something to be wished for, but rather it's a, a necessity, as you saw from some of the demonstrations. There's, you literally cannot investigate and prosecute these cases anymore, the large-scale ones, over the Internet without very strong international cooperation. Um, it's why uh, our agency, we have 70 offices outside of the United States. And you wonder, you know, well, why do you have 70 offices outside the United States at vast expenses. Well, we cannot engage in this kind of investigation without those kinds of relationships. And so um, I uh, have no doubt that the support from the United States uh, to Europol generally and to EC3 is going to be um, very, very deep. And I also think that we are going to see more and more of these very large scale operations and initiatives that are going to be announced uh, jointly. Um, we are the chair of the virtual, uh, virtual global task force right now, but that uh, is focused on online child exploitation, involves uh, the major players from around the world. So it, it's a bright day. We've got a lot of work to be done. There are some challenging issues when it comes to privacy and extraterritorial jurisdiction and you know, who prosecutes, who investigates, but we're going to get through it. The, the stakes are pretty high. Uh, we've got to get it right. 
AFP. Good morning, Nicolas Dolonet from Agence France Presse. I have a question for um, Mrs. Malmström. Um, you said that the cyber criminals are ahead at the moment. How long do you think it will need to close the gap and how can this be done? They are ahead, and that's why I also said that, that in a way, uh, one could ask um, oneself why this centre wasn't created uh, earlier. Uh, but we know that cyber criminals, as organised crime in general, as was expressed here by, by, by all the experts, uh, are very well organised. They know how to, to use uh, cross-border uh, facilities. And uh, police has, has been running ahead, and that's why it makes it even more running uh, uh, beyond. Uh, and that's why it makes it even more important to, uh, to sit together, to exchange information, to share what we know, to make sure that not only one investigation goes on there, but that we link together that information so that the big networks, the big fish, can, can be caught. And this is what Europol has been very good at, and, and increasingly, as information will be shared, that, that would be the key cornerstone of the EC3, because you cannot get anything out of it unless you put in. And what you put in is not only money and, and, and uh, human resources, it's also the information. And, and the trust that, that you can share it with, with each other. So yes, uh, organized crime and cyber crimes, uh, criminals are advanced. Uh, there's a lot of work going on already in different organizations and in the member states. Of course, we need to build upon that, link it even better together to make sure that we catch up with that. It's very difficult to measure how and then and, and when, but as you saw already, there are good examples of how Europol and the EC3 are working today and hopefully that will increase and, and make it more difficult for the, for the criminals. I might even uh, add to the commissioner here that <coughs> in the EC3 we have actually a spe specific team for looking into this, which are looking from a helicopter perspective what is going on, trying to make horizontal scanning, environmental scanning, but not just this, also with industry. Raj here from, uh, from uh, Trent and from McAfee Semantic has engaged also in scenario buildings. What will happen in the industry? Where is the development on the internet? Where is the money? And then we look at it because we know that it's not just used for nice purposes, but the criminals will also try to exploit. So by looking forward, we will be able then to tell Mr. Banfi, where should we train the police officers? What should be the countermeasures? Where should we be? So we are actually trying very rapidly to close this gap. There will always be a bit ahead of it, but we are actually doing pretty well. Gentlemen in front. Uh, I'm from China Radio International, and uh, my question goes to uh, Mrs. Malmström and both to uh, Mr. Orton. And uh, according to the report, uh, that 89% of the European people, when they use the internet, they they are not to put their real names uh, when they are doing anything on the internet. So uh, the question goes to Mr. Orton. If that means that uh, when the uh, criminals are doing the same, they, when, when they're doing any illegal activities on the internet, they will not leave any trace on the internet without putting their real information or uh, activities. Uh, if that means that uh, it will make more difficult for you to trace or uh, identify those criminal criminals. And the uh, question goes to uh, Mr. Malmström. Uh, will it be possible for the EU to uh, make any uh, director, uh, directories or rules to, to make it, uh, make it uh, obligatory or uh, for internet users in the future to put their real names, uh, real informations? Uh, on the internet when they doing anything on the internet. Thank you. Well, let, let me first, uh, on, on the, you referred to uh, the figure I gave in my uh, introductory remarks. What it says is that we've been asking thousands of people around Europe in the Eurostat, and we do that regularly so we can compare uh, the trends from year to year, is that a very large amount of, of people are feel threatened to give away their banking accounts when they want to, to purchase something on the internet, for instance. It doesn't mean that they make up wrong identities. It means that they are not, they feel uncomfortable revealing their bank accounts or, or their, their visa number or, or whatever, uh, which is, is uh, 
very worrying because it means that, that they don't feel safe in being free internet uh, consumers. So that, it doesn't mean that, that they may make them up, and I'll leave to Charles to, 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 to answer the other question. Uh, no, we are not planning any, any directives to force people to, to reveal their, their, their real identity. There could be other ways that you want to have an identity in the different social networks that is by no way criminal. Um, but it is worrying that people, consumers, feel uncomfortable in using the full potential of, of internet and therefore refrain from living <coughs> their digital lives in the different social networks, but also purchasing that affects the economy and, and, and the business negatively. And that's why also we need to, to, to really address, and that is one of the priorities of the EC3, to address uh, um, credit card fraud, uh, identity theft and issues like that. So hopefully citizens will feel more safe. And um, you're right that it's, of course, easy to hide on the internet. But uh, the good thing about the internet is there's always its race. So, so this is also the bad thing for, for the perpetrators. So I don't think that there is, you know, 100% possibility to hide. There's a lot of challenges here. We're also seeing now that, that, that people are shifting from storing data on their hard drives at home, in the clouds. And there will be uh, numbers of, of challenges and problems in the future. But I'm actually quite confident that we together because we have all the information. And if we actually treat them well, that we will be able also to, 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 to still maintain. And then we're in a dialogue with the, with the internet governance system, which is also making these traces available. So I, I'm quite confident. It's difficult, but it's not uh, unsolvable. Any final question? We'll do it fast and yes, lady, uh, lady in the back. Um, I just wanted to ask you about uh, the proposals for the new data protection directive uh, that have been made from the Commission and whether you think that in particular the data breach notification rules will have any impact on your work. Well, the, the, the data protection framework is right now being negotiated in, in the Parliament and with the Member States. It has done quite some, some progress the, the, the last weeks and we're very happy about that, but it's far too, too early to see what, what effect that, that will have. And I think we will work in an indirect way, and that's where Steve Purser comes in, because the contact to, to the third community and the industry, where they every day see the breaches, and they might not all report them to the police for various reasons, but they might tell it to Inisa. And if we can get, I don't care about who is doing it, it's more the pattern, the trends, so that we can actually use this to warn other ones. And then again, we profile. And if we see somebody's popping up very efficiently, why not then ask a member state to concentrate on specifically that? So we will also solve that problem, I hope. The lady in the front, and then the last uh, question for Mr. Hetzel, please. Good morning. Journalist from the People's Daily, Beijing. Uh, first of all, congratulations for setting up the European Cyber Crime Center. As we noticed that the cooperation between EU and America in cyber crime um, is going on very well. I wonder, in America, do you have the same type of center uh, in order to share the information? We know the importance of sharing the information. And also, in future, um, is there any possibilities for America and the EU to cooperate with Asia, with China, in civil crime? Thank you very much. Maybe I should take the, yeah. the last first. I, I think it's, it's very, very important that we also engage with other countries. We have a legal framework that, that uh, actually regulates how, who we can um, exchange operational agreement, and China is not on this list, it <coughs> might appear. But um, oh, my, my good friend again, Nubu from, from Interpol, he will take up the responsibility in Singapore also to try to coordinate this. And I'm sure that we can work through this center in order again to that we will take care of the European mainland and he will take care of the rest of the world, so to say. And then it just, we need to click in where, where we can do it. And then eventually we will maybe find a, a more straightforward way of cooperating. But I think the other way will work very, very, very uh, smoothly. Mr. Morton. So uh, with regard to the United States, yes, we, we do. We have the Cyber Crimes uh, Center uh, that, that my agency runs. I Obviously, international cooperation is the um, future, and I think cooperation in Asia is critical. And just to give you some sense of it, we just did a, a large operation involving counterfeit 
airbags that were being yeah. sold over the internet. And uh, the, every major uh, automobile manufacturer, European, uh, US, uh, uh, and Asian was involved. Uh, many of the counterfeit airbags were coming out of uh, the People's Republic of China. And uh, we were able to pursue that case, uh, not only from an online perspective, uh, but also with um, working with the Chinese to actually um, find the factories that were producing uh, these counterfeit airbags. We had them all tested, and they failed uh, quite dramatically. And a number of them actually exploded. So it's an interesting convergence of the problem that we all see here with the internet and, and uh, you know, daily activities such as driving. And I think it reflects a broader question that all of us are going to have to wrestle with, which is, you know, what are uh, the rules uh, for the internet? We're in the middle of a, a debate as, as civilized societies on that question, and the internet has advanced so rapidly that we haven't, we haven't quite caught up. Um, we can all agree what the rules should be just outside the window here in The Hague um, for a set of crimes. Uh, translating that to the internet is, is trickier uh, than you would first imagine. And there are a lot of conflicting aims, of freedom of speech, uh, a sense of the internet being a great uh, free and powerful force, mm -hmm. and yet at the same time recognizing that mm -hmm. in the hands of the wrong people, very, very uh, real uh, abuse and harm can take place. And, and as societies, we need to figure out, well, what are the rules going to be for the internet? Mm -hmm. Obviously, I think from our perspective, it needs to be uh, a vibrant but lawful place. And the final question? Yeah, thank you very much. My Chinese colleague from Beijing, from People's Daily, already put it forward. I wanted, wanted to also ask about uh, China. But let me put my question then broader. Uh, how is the international cooperation against cybercrime already organized? I know the United States are represented here, Interpol is represented here. China has been already answered the question. So how is the cooperation with other huge countries like for example, Russia, with India, with Brazil. And to put it more broader, are there much more challenges? What can be improved? Well, I might, I might just answer that, because we have to be realistic as well. What we're not establishing today is, is, is a new United Nations in the fight against cybercrime. That, that, you know, there are many political and other reasons why uh, that's just overly ambitious right now. We have to work with the opportunities that we have. As Trolls said, uh, Europol maintains a framework of international uh, operations, uh, international cooperation, uh, and we can use that to have real operational cooperation with, with the countries that you mentioned. We're also currently negotiating in, in a very advanced stage uh, a similar agreement with Russia, for example. So uh, I am hopeful that we, that we can make EC3 a, a meaningful player, also in global terms. Uh, but we're not going to uh, revolutionize the world and create something that's going to have a massive global impact, certainly not overnight. What we have to do, meanwhile, notwithstanding the fact that this is a global crime, is take care of our business, at least in the EU, as much as possible, and recognize that in Europe, we have the most integrated political and economic region in the world. We have established, well advanced, established uh, political and, and other institutions that can support organizations like Europol and the establishment of EC3. We are here today because of a proposal made by the Commission, because of a proposal supported by the Council of Ministers, and because of the legal and advanced economic framework of the EU, which facilitates the establishment of such a powerful new centre. So at least in the EU, we are doing as much as we possibly can to respond to this crime um, in, in an effective way. Thank you. And as already mentioned, EC3 uh, staff will be available in the press room for interviews. And there will also be possibility now right after to have a one-to-one -one, uh, interview with the members of the, the panel in case you're interested in this. And I will leave uh, the floor now for Mr. Uh, Wainwright to conclude. Thank you, Soren. Just a final uh, minute from me then, just to thank everyone for, for coming here today, uh, for listening to the very interesting speeches that we've heard uh, from my colleagues on the stage and uh, the experts as well. What have we heard about? We've heard about botnets, deep sea, dark net. These are all uh, techie terms that may not seem much in reality. Well, what we've heard over the last hour or so is that they do mean something in reality. 
that the internet is changing all the time uh, and evolving in a way that's presenting ever more opportunities for, for criminals. Those criminals are exploiting those op opportunities sometimes very quickly, adeptly, and it's causing real harm, uh, harm, massive financial harm, physical harm in many cases, as we've heard, and other serious harms as well. So we face a real problem. And the establishment of EC3 is designed to meet that problem head on, uh, to work collectively with uh, the member states of Europol, our international partners, to make sure that we can work in a more coherent way with industry as well uh, to face up to these, these growing problems that we have. We have a modest ambitions, but we also have a very clear agenda for the future. We have begun work already, as you've, as you've seen, and I've no doubt that very soon EC3 will establish itself uh, in, in the same way as John talked about uh, the parallel experience in the United States as a very important instrument in the fight against cybercrime. We rely on your help in achieving that success, uh, and we already know that we can draw on, on your full support. And with that in mind, I'd like to thank you for, for coming today and I wish you all a happy new year. Thank you.